Welcome back for this panel discussion. We're focusing on the topic, developing a sustainable strategic framework for leadership education. If you have any questions for any of the panelists, it's going to be, we want you to ask the questions straight to the points, just no comments, no thoughts, just questions. Uh, so we'll take a, question, take a pool of questions and then we'll have them answered. Okay, gentlemen in. My name is Bala Mohammed. I teach Bayer University Mass Communication mm -hmm. Department. I direct my question to Professor Uwidwe and uh, about the raising and promoting the potential of our next generation of leaders. Sometimes I ask my students what they want to be in life. And they have no ambition beyond their NYSE but to become National Assembly members. All 160 million of us cannot be National Assembly members. Why? Because the current leadership is well paid and that is the ambition of many people. Secondly, about this reorientation, if the nation wants our youth to grow, to love our country and as patriotism, as you said, that we should look at, NTA, for instance, sometimes declines to show NTA network news, which is a national affair. The president speaks to us, the National Assembly speaks to us, etc., etc. But they show the English Premier League instead of the NTA Network News. They, we have a league in Nigeria where no youth knows about it. They have heard of Ahimba, but they don't know where it is. They don't know the players of Canopilas. My children don't know the Canopilas players, but they know Lionel Messi and Ronaldo and others. We have to start somewhere, uh, Prof. So that reorientation, as long as we have to rely on Britain to jail our criminals. What are we teaching the students? How do we reorient the judiciary, the National Assembly, and the NTA? Thank Mohammed, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Leo Ezekiel, Icon Blaze Magazine. My question also goes to the professor. On tertiary education, you said that our values of tertiary education is the starting point. Why is it that students of universities, in all exams they enter to write, they come in with chips, which they call amokalekele, to cheat, and they all cheat in that exams? Hello, hello, hello. Be patient. Please. I said, university under, undergraduates in examination halls. They are always being freaked by invigilators. A lot of them are caught with chips of papers around themselves. And they face panels. If they, the students, go on cheating in examination hall, what will be the outcome by the time they are being produced as graduates? Because, for example, sorry, for example, some of them that come into journalism, when you send them on simple assignments, go to a stadium, and bring three titles. They go to stadiums and come and tell you nothing happens at stadiums. Yet, he or she is from University of Lagos, mass com communication student. Or, and, excuse me. Okay, allow the gentleman to speak. But please, three seconds. Three, we, need, right we need to, to move on. Please, three excuse seconds, me. Please, we need to move on. Thank Don't you. hush me down. This is a public policy event. I, I'm telling you what, I, I'm an editor and a publisher. I have sent some people out to gather me events at events. They will come out to tell me nothing happens. Oh, thank you. I'm sure that the professor has gotten your question. Next, please. Thank you. Good oh, afternoon. Good. good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Nafisa Haliru, a proud daughter of Africa and an added member of Corona Secondary School community. And I have a question for Mrs. Adefisayo and also Mr. Fred Swanika, since they work in the school community. Now, as a student, I'm saying this from my point of view. How do we get... The, the people who are leaders now to believe in the, the children now. Like, if I'm a leader, for instance, because I'm young, how do we get older people to follow me and listen to what I have to say? Then how do we get the parents to believe in us, the children? Because in Africa, most parents believe that it's all about the first child, the first son. They believe in gender, that only the males be able to do well, only the first child be able to do well. Then also, how do we get the teachers to believe that it's not only science students in school that can succeed. Also art students and commercial students. Because most parents say, if you decide to be an art student, I will not pay your school fees. And then students um, read and read courses that they don't want to read. And then at the end of the day, they become a doctor. Meanwhile, 
their heart desires to be a lawyer and then they become what you call a rubbish leader. How do we stop all this? How do we curb all these things and stop it in the nation? Thank you, Nafisa. My name is Osuji Chukwemeka. I'm a student of Methodist Boys High School. I'm here to ask a general question to everyone there. Most of the discussions here are centered on the leadership and mindsets of youths. Don't you think our leaders are affecting the mindsets of our youths by their actions? Looking at it economically, Nigeria is practicing a kind of mixed economy, meaning the combination of both the capitalist economy and socialist economy. Anyhow they come, definitely, all these institutions, like for instance the capitalist economy, most of the um, forms of production are owned by private individuals. Definitely, these private individuals who come out from schools, one way or the other, this will definitely... Chukwemeka, I'm sorry to butt in, but I need you to ask a specific question. Thank you. I mean, don't you think our leaders and... Don't you think our leaders are affecting the mindset of our youth by their actions? My name is Arewa Ali. I'm from Last Tooth. Uh, my question is that I had the prof use a phrase, good followers, and he, he, he buttressed his point using Egypt. So I want to know, what's your basis for using Egyptians as good followers? Thank you, sir. My name is uh, Professor Abdullah Oba Adamu from Bayer University, Kano. My question is to Mrs. Uh, Poloshade Ade Pisayo. Uh, you talk a lot about the curriculum. We talk a lot about the inadequacies of the curriculum. I just want you to tell me, how can we factor in indigenous knowledge systems in order to make the curriculum far much more effective than it is at the moment? Because that is what is lacking. The, the knowledge that our people, our communities have in order to make the curriculum much more dynamic within the world system and world mindset of learning. How can we factor in this particular concept of indigenous knowledge system to make the curriculum more effective. Thank you. My name is Ayola Idris Fadi from the University of Lagos. My question goes to Prof. Sir. Um, I want you to clarify to us what your understanding of free education is as against what Chief of our, of our family, our lower propagated. And also, how does this affect the psyche of our, we youths as regards to the leadership qualities? And also, reacting to what Mr. Fred said, you did say that we need our leaders to be, we, we need leadership to change the leaders in us. But I will not agree with you. The, we, do, we do not necessarily need our leaders. We ourselves, we, we, it is not until we get to the position of the leadership that we, we should make the change in the society. And also, on the education, I have found out that it is the priority given to the science class or the science department that makes the students not to, to concentrate in their classes. For example, now, if you find an art uh, student Sorry, or I'm sorry to butt in, but I do need you to ask a question, a specific question. Okay, There's thank you. This, just, this is, this is just a contribution. We should, we should not lay more emphasis on science education than any other part of education. Thank right, you very much. You. The first question uh, dealing with, um, I think it's a very, very important question because it raises the issue that a country must be proactive in protecting its own culture. The France, France actually, started a ministry of culture or instructed ministry of culture to now make sure that the new words that are coming from the new technology of internet are given French equivalent names. You know, because these new words are coming out, they never existed in the dictionary, but to protect their culture, to make sure that the French, cult, French language is not invaded by this new lingo from internet technology or such technology, they now have a ministry taking charge of that. So pointing this out is not anything radical. It is very important for our own, I think we have a national orientation agency to take it upon itself, to uh, be very, very proactive in protecting our own football league and other such inversions without, without punishing free choice. I mean, if I like to watch 
a, a good a football contest in a very beautiful stadium and so on. It's my choice as long as I can afford DSTV. But it also does not preclude that particular agency from doing what it can to protect our own interest as far as our culture is um, concerned. So I think that's a very important thing. The second one is cheating, the question of cheating in our classrooms. And it all boils down to the same thing as well. It's the fast track to everything, the value of fast track the value of beating the system, the value of someone trying to cheat. That's what it's all about. We have to beat the system. We don't have to do the work. Remember I said that the work ethic has gone down and that the value has been replaced. And that is exactly what the cheating is all about. Cheating is cutting corners. That's what cheating is. Instead of doing the work, instead of studying hard and coming out as brilliant as Julius uh, at MIT, who, by the way, is a graduate of my own university, where I retired from, and I'm so proud of him. But if you have that kind of system permeates the whole society, then what you get is what you pay for. Um, and so then the young student was asking about um, followership. I think it's important. I think, I think leadership is not easy. You know. Uh, 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 President Clinton once observed that to be an American president is like running a cemetery. You talk and talk and talk and nobody is listening down there. So it's, it's definitely uh, not an easy thing to be a leader. To help our leaders, we must be good followers. We must be good followers. We must point out when they are doing wrong. We must do things that show that they will give us back respect. And our leaders will not say no to it. So if we just lay back and uh, have this free mentality and the leaders will supply, then we, of course, uh, get it the wrong way. And then there's this question about free education. I think you're right. I think the young man is right by pointing out uh, a possible contradiction with the great free education culture that Awolowo introduced here in the West. We know that that is the best rural policy that anybody has done in this country. But the important thing, and I don't know where the young man is, so look at him, tell him this. The important thing is that he did not compromise quality. He did not compromise merit. And that's why the quality of education supported by that free education uh, was, uh, was very, very good. And that's the point, the point of this time is that the free education by our government has compromised merit and competition and quality. That was the point I was making. Okay, let, let's take a question. There was a question uh, thrown to you from Nafisa. Uh, how do we get our leaders to really lead? How do we get our parents to lead? Uh, and why, and that's uh, what she called discrimination against art students and schools? Again, it's a question of uh the values of the society again and mindset the way we think about these children because i know as a practitioner that parents all want their children to do science to be doctors some children are not going to do science some children are going to do other things i think it's all the value systems that we've built up there's no career that is not important and uh, i still believe that we need to do a lot of uh, public uh, we need to hold a lot of these conversations out in the public to let parents and uh, everybody know that. Let, let, let's play to a child's strength and not try and force a child to do what he or she was not meant to do. There is nothing wrong in a child being a musician or a dancer or an actor or an artist or an English graduate. It's all the, it's, what matters is what you do with it. We've seen doctors and engineers who are just not doing anything productive with what they learned. So I think it's still how do we get these conversations out in the open? And um, I, can I also address the professor who talked about our curriculum, and I'll try and weave yes. it in with the Nafisa, Nafisa's uh, question. The professor talked about how we can factor our indigenous knowledge systems into our curriculum. Now, in everything we've said about curriculum, honestly, we haven't talked much about the content. 
but I will say too, just to copy um, Nafisa, that as a proud daughter of Africa, as a proud daughter of Nigeria, I know that we have to go back to who we were before. Our children, our curriculum in Nigeria, I teach in, I, I work in secondary education, and I know that our, our children do not even understand the history of this country from what we've done with our curriculum, the way we've watered it down and weakened it. So that you find that a Nigerian child leaves school, he does not know anything about Sadauna, about Zik, Zik, other than the fact that he says they were born in so-so year and they died in so-so year. But they are exploits to what they did. I remember a child coming to me the year Enahoro died and said, who is Anthony Enahoro? Why wouldn't a Nigerian child know the person who moved the motion for independence? So I do think that when we talk about curriculum, we are not saying Western curriculum. We've got to build something that is going to really work for us. And one thing that will work for us is for us to understand who we were, where we came from, our culture, our values. Our values as Africans are not what we, are, what we have today. I don't believe, I know how I grew up. I knew my grandparents, my parents, and I know they were solid, decent people who looked at people as people. What have you achieved? Not what car do you drive? All right, thank you. Let's, uh, thank let's you. Uh, take more questions. Pardon? Your name, who you're addressing your question to, and then your question. Please keep Good it morning. short. Good morning. My name is Yomi, and I'm addressing my question to the professor. I want to ask, is there a difference between an entrepreneur and a leader? Hmm. Um, good morning. My name is Akinawe Innocent from the College of Medicine of University of Lagos. My question goes to Mrs. Falashade Adefisayo. First, we've talked um, so much about um, curriculum adjustments. My question is this, how do we get the government to look into curriculum adjustments? And as someone in the teaching sector, can you, can you do something about it? What I mean is, on your own parts, can you adjust the curriculum, the way you teach your children? And my second question goes to Professor Owundiwe. How do we instill accountability, responsibility, and moral values in the mindset of our youth? Because if you look at um, the youth of today, if you ask them, okay, what do you want to do when you get to um, power tomorrow? They'll tell you that, okay, when they get there, they'll also do the same thing. They'll also lose money. But how do we get to correct um, the mindset of the youths? And also, the next one is, how do we change the cycle, the cycle of bad leadership in our, in our country today? What we have today in, in Nigeria is that um, tenures run in and out, and what we have is bad governance. Keep, um, keep, going, through, keep going around in cycle. We have um, um, father figures that will bring in someone there into power that they will keep controlling. How do we change this? If we happen to groom good leaders for tomorrow, how do we get them to participate actively in politics so that they can, that they can get into power and make the necessary changes that this country deserves? Thank you. Uh, my name is uh, uh, Dr. Awal from Bayro University. Uh, well, of course, mine is a general question. Uh, of course, a lot has been said about curriculum as being uh, more of theory than practical. Now, the main issue is sometimes you have to look at training for leadership from example. Now, what uh, do you suggest about uh, training our leaders by example? Because you have been talking about uh, followership, followership, followership. Do you expect uh, follow, uh, I mean, uh, uh, the masses to follow at least people who are not, uh, you know, for, for example, morally sound in terms of leadership. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. My name is Maya Wasalu. I'm a community development advocate. I would like to direct this question to uh, Mrs. Fisayo. Um, Ma, you haven't, none of you have mentioned the importance of our local languages in revolutionizing our education. Now, I may like to test my um, own point of view by asking our beautifully dressed students here, how many of them can speak our local languages? <laughs> because that is a very essential part. That is a very essential part of education. For example, if you are praying, you are praying in English, 
you find it more difficult as an African to pray in English than you pray in your la local language. That's a communication between you and your God. Now compare you teaching me mechanic or compare you teaching me um, law or English or any, any, any subject in my local language. I believe if we don't do this, we cannot get it right. Some of us, even parents, we abhor our, our children from speaking our local languages in our houses until we, until we turn English language and any foreign language to vernacular in our schools. We cannot get it right. Any, any child that says... All right, thank you. We're gonna, we need to take the next question. Thank you. Thank you very much. My name is Roti Miawai from the University of Lagos. Uh, my question is directed to uh, Mrs. Fasayo. And I, I want to ask about the role of the parents. Now, not in terms of career choice, but giving the children a voice. Because in an average home in Nigeria, children are shut down. They don't allow them to speak. You know, they don't allow them to hear their opinions. So how can the parents here come in? Because if they're all trained and grown up in schools, when they get home, they don't get a chance to practice what they've learned. So how can this work where parents will give the children the opportunity to lead even in the home? Now, my quest second question is to uh, Professor Iberi. Now, this is addressing teacher training, basically. I mean, I'm studying business education and I'm still being trained with a typewriter. And I'm expected to lead or to train future leaders. How can I train future leaders with uh, ancient tools? Please, what can be done to, in this regard? Thank you very much, Ano. Another, another thing very also is, point. I'm sorry, another thing is the recycling of lecture notes. It's rather unfortunate that sometimes we get to be taught what our forefathers learned, even in the 21st century. So please, what do we do? Thank you. Thank you very much. Good morning. My name is Udeme Tukayan. I'm, I'm an investment and uh, infrastructure advisor. I'd like to throw the question to the panelists. Um, I understand what uh, the professor said about leadership, but top to bottom, I think that uh, we don't have up to 10,000 leaders in a country of 161, uh, 60, 60 million people. So at the end of the day, I think the problem is bad followership because we don't demand the responsibility that we deserve. At the end of the day, what we get is what we have. In places like China, you, 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 deserve to, you, need to be in gov you need to be in private practice for a minimum of six to seven years before you get into government. In Nigeria today, we have designed the system to circumvent itself. How do you leave a benchmark for being in a national assembly to be a first school living certificate? How do you encourage people? Because uh, capacity basically is a function of education, experience, and exposure. So if you don't have the people who are grounded in various fields, making policies, at the end of the day, we'll still design policies that are, des that are built to fail and will never really make any progress. So the, bo the bottom line is we must encourage INEC, we must encourage the people who are the real leaders, they are the ones that put the leaders in place, to demand responsible and capacity-driven people to sit in those positions at all times. Thank you. Thank you. We've completely exhausted our time. We were, we're actually scheduled 15 minutes for this question and answer session, but we've, done, we've actually done 30 minutes. So if, uh, there's another panel discussion coming up and you get the opportunity to ask more questions. I do apologize, but we have to stop there. Thank you. Somebody asked a question. Uh, the difference between uh, an entrepreneur okay, so and I'll a leader. Okay, so I'll answer just this one. Um, well, I, I will start with uh, the most difficult question, <laughs> which is the distinction between, um, well, not most difficult, but most uh, academic, not best just on my own opinion the distinction between entrepreneur and uh, leaders, and the leader. Well, you know, um, a leader sets a vision, a mission, and he pursues it, he pursues those, and makes people follow them with principles that are not used by entrepreneurs. These uh, approaches and principles include empowerment, it includes diplomacy, and it also includes inclusive leadership. These are not qualities that an entrepreneur will give away for free. An entrepreneur wants to build his business, and um, he's not going to play around with all these uh, issues that uh, a leader uh, will be expected to use in his persuasion to make others follow his lead. And um, uh, 
and uh, well, we have leaders here in the room who can attest to all of that. But um, the other question is uh, about uh, leadership by example. It's an observation. I think it's a very good thing to lead by example. And it takes me directly to the issue of uh, colonialism that the gentleman objected to. Well, my point is, was not that our colonial leaders were angels. The point was that they, proved, they have proved by examples of our leaders since independence, I mean, since the First Republic, in any case, and uh, uh, they have proved that they, um, they were more uh, patriotic. They, 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 they infused competition. We, uh, uh, we, we saw the work that has been given, example here of Awolowo. That was a very hard work uh, that he did in the region that he controlled. The same thing of Azikiwe, the same thing of Amadou Bello. Amadou Bello did not vie for power. He refused to come to Lagos and become prime minister. And he instead stayed back to become a premier in his own, um, in his own region. So these were not people hungry for power like we have them today. These are uh, people who were doing what they thought was the best to move the country forward. This has been a CNBC Africa special broadcast on the Motala Mahal.